So there's, and a part of that is people would say that women didn't live quite as long um, 50 years ago, 75, 100 years ago, and that's why that they didn't, we didn't end up with so many reproductive cancers. But that certainly isn't the only explanation. Exactly. Um, let's talk again about our total exposure to estrogens, because when we talk about young girls menstruating much earlier mm -hmm. and women living longer, that also means that over a total lifetime we're exposed to estrogens. Is that one worry that we have about girls menstruating so much younger that they're being exposed both within their bodies and outside their bodies to estrogens for a much longer period of time? Sure, and, and of course the, you know, the, the longer period uh, is going to increase their incidence of breast cancer. Uh, if a, a young lady starts menstruating at a younger age, uh, she's gonna have an increased risk for developing breast cancer. And um, you know that this the exposure, the continuous exposure, is a problem. And you have to look at um, just even the the diet. Uh, I have had seven and eight year olds come into my practice who have started uh, developing breast buds already. And uh, when you really start to analyze their diet and their exposures, what you'll find is that they're big milk drinkers. And there are some kids out there who are drinking three, four glasses of milk a day. And you'll find uh, that they're also big meat eaters. And those are definitely exposures. Yeah, through that they're exposed to a host of different estrogens and estrogenic activity. Yes. Um, it's interesting to me in talking about your, your, that breast cancer um, and incidence of breast cancer has risen so much with all these exposures to estrogen, and yet there's so much publicity about finding a cure for breast cancer. Why do you think there's not much more conversation about preventing breast cancer? Because obviously it's these estrogens that are certainly contributing to the, to the rise in breast cancer. So why does the conversation focus totally on a cure rather than on prevention? I see you smiling here. <laughs> that's a loaded question. That's a, that's a show in itself, yes, I suppose. Yes, it's a show in itself, and I, I do believe that it's very political. Expand on that. Well, you know, it, it, I, I realize I'm putting you. I realize <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. But well, and there, there, you know, you have to realize that there is there is an industry there. Um, certainly, um, sure. Oh. There's a beef industry. There's a cattle industry. There's a poultry industry. And there is a breast cancer industry. Absolutely. And um, you know, it's something that that uh, you you don't necessarily like to admit to. Uh, but it is there, it does exist, and personally, uh, I believe uh, that, that the focus does need to be on prevention. We don't need to be racing for the cure, we need to be racing for prevention. Let's talk about the pharmaceutical industry for a, little, for, uh, for a bit, because you mentioned birth control pills a while mm -hmm. back, which really, as far as, as, as birth control in this country, that's the most widely used contracep method of contraception, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, how is that contributed? Now, now, are there studies that show that some birth control pills or that all birth control pills contribute to some of these problems? Yes, what we know is that if a woman takes birth control pills for five years, she's just doubled her risk for breast cancer. So if the risk is already one out of eight women, and uh, you know, let's say that it runs in my family, and I'm, I'm very much a numbers person, so and, and if I were to take birth control pills for five years, then I've just doubled my risk and now my risk is one out of four. Is that a risk as a woman that I'm willing to accept? No, absolutely not. But we do know that. And uh, if you go back to the original uh, developer of the birth control pill and look at some of the things uh, that he was uh, concerned about as he was developing uh, birth control pills, uh, this was one of the things. It was never meant to be something that people would take continuously. Uh, it was something that um, really was designed for women who were already having hormonal problems, or maybe for the woman, uh, you know, synthetic estrogens were developed for the woman who, who what, you know, maybe was born without ovaries and was not able to uh, live a normal life because of that. That was the original design. But very quickly, it was marketed. Um, in the early beginning in the early 1960s as yes. as contraception and very very quickly and widely accepted mm -hmm. but let's talk about menopause for a bit because we've been talking about about girls and women um, before menopause how does does your description of hormonal imbalance differ after menopause or in the perimenopausal period okay you know I, I think it's really a continuum and I think that most women know 
um, if, if they are suffering from, some, from something like this. Um, I would have women all the time come to me in my practice and it really didn't matter if they were in their 30s. There were women in their 30s who thought they were going through menopause, maybe even had been told that they were going through menopause already. Uh, but uh, a lot of the, the, and they would come in and they would say, there's something wrong with my hormones. Now, let me ask you, because you're talking about girls menstruating earlier and now you're mentioning women thinking they're going through menopause earlier. So is that as much of a problem as, because we hear so much publicity about, about girls menstruating earlier, mm -hmm. but not so much about women going through menopause earlier. Is this, is this a problem that you see? It is a problem that we see, and basically what happens is uh, as you have this large uh, load of estrogens being put into the body uh, over time, uh, there's such a hormone imbalance, the progesterone levels are, are remarkably low. And that person with low progesterone or no progesterone is not able to ovulate. And so because she's not able to ovulate, many times she has erratic cycles or maybe not any cycles at all. Now has her body actually gone through menopause? No. If you give that woman progesterone, she will start cycling normally again. So menopause really, I mean we should talk about that menopause is absolutely natural. Mm -hmm. That all women, if you live to a certain age, go through it. And that concerns me a little bit. I mean, is that because because you mentioned before that that you also think that progesterone would benefit women after menopause? But if menopause is a natural occurrence, why would you then want to take a um, or, or apply a hormone that your body has stopped producing naturally? Right. Well, it's because of the exposure that we're continuing to have. Uh, no, no matter how you slice it or dice it, we're going to continue. Uh, well into our 80s, 90s, for the rest of our life, lives to have estrogenic exposures. And that is the reason that we need to continue I see. with this. So talk a little bit about this protocol to reduce estrogen dominance then. Would it be the same for premenopausal as postmenopausal women? No, it's not the same at all. Uh, with uh, premenopausal women, really what you want to do is just mimic what their body would do naturally. And that would be if a woman is menstruating or having a cycle, you know, her normal progesterone surge is mid-cycle and then it slowly gradually tapers off uh, as she uh, starts her period. And that's what you would want to mimic. So for women who are still having a cycle, uh, who are premenopausal, I usually recommend that they use natural progesterone, about 20 milligrams a day, uh, during the back half of their cycle, which would be about day 12 through 26. Now when you talk most. about natural progesterone, I is this available over the counter? It is available over the counter. Isn't that a bit dangerous? Because, because you're talking, you're describing your different protocols depending on how old women are, you know, whether or not they're menstruating, whether or not their periods are abnormal, whether or not they're in menopause. Isn't that a little bit dangerous that women then would begin treating themselves with an over-the-counter um, uh, product? And how good are these instructions on these kind of mm -hmm. products? Well. Uh, that's something that, uh, that is debatable, certainly, but what I like to do many times, if I'm looking for an example, I like to go back to nature. And certainly if you look at uh, the pregnant woman, I like to use her as an example, uh, the pregnant woman uh, during the last trimester of pregnancy will produce up to 400 milligrams a day of progesterone. Now what we're talking about is using 20 milligrams a day. Uh, but 400 milligrams a day of progesterone. And think back to those women who had eight, 10, 12 babies over their lifetime, they certainly had a tremendous uh, progesterone exposure. Now, while they may have had some reproductive problems in terms of uh, their uterus or whatever, uh, they were very healthy women. Rarely would you see that woman get breast cancer. And, uh, you know, so if you look at that, it kind of really helps you to understand the safety. Very, very quickly, what should women look for in a progesterone cream? Okay, this is important. A few things. One, and, and there are so many different um, uh, products available out there, but when you're evaluating a progesterone cream, you want to look for, number one, you want to make sure that it's USP uh, progesterone, which stands for US Pharmacopoeia. That just ensures that you're actually getting progesterone. Uh, number two, you want to make sure that it's in an airtight container. Uh, many products out there will have a pump 
inside of them that actually moves up as you're pumping it and that ensures that no air is getting into the product. Some products will be in jars that you take the lid off and uh, as you're taking that lid off of course you've, you're getting exposure to air and to light and oxidation can occur with that. Uh, so that would be something to look for. And then also I like the, uh, the pumps uh, because they're metered and you're getting exactly one teaspoon or 20 milligrams every time you accentuate the pump. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Deanna Osborne, for joining us to talk about hormone imbalance in women. For upcoming episodes, viewer feedback, and links to important information, log on to our website at the address that appears on your screen. Thanks for joining us on Health Vision, a production of WOUB Public Television. That's a great show.